Hey, what's up, fiber folks? Welcome back or welcome to High Fiber Knits. My name is Emily and today I wanted to talk about buying yarn intentionally. You may know that this year I am on a little bit of a journey to work through stash. I am aiming to have a net negative stash meaning that I want to knit more yarn than I bring in, essentially. Um, and so after a pretty big yarn declutter in January, I really wanted to be able to go forward with prioritizing the yarns that I had remaining, as well as being really selective and mindful about the yarns that I am choosing to bring into my collection going forward. So to that end, I wanted to share some of the prompts or some of the strategies that I apply in my own project planning process to be able to strike a balance of, you know, loving on the yarns that I already have while still being able to enjoy the inspiration and the satisfaction that comes from getting new yarn and being able to work with it. But before I give any more detail, I do want to say that when we're talking about yarn buying, it is a really nuanced conversation and everybody has a different set of values or circumstances that are inherently a part of how you buy yarn. And so I'm talking about things like overconsumption, sustainability, um, environmental impact, animal welfare, price accessibility, if you choose to use vegan yarns, if you want to support small businesses or BIPOC owned businesses. Um, a lot of different things go into how we make decisions about the yarns that we're purchasing, but these are not necessarily tips. I feel like tips would apply imply that I have some sort of like authority on this topic and I don't and I don't want this to be prescriptive by any means but one of my observations has been that from my own sort of journey on knitting and knitting social media I started around the same time as a lot of folks who started making podcasts here on YouTube and not everybody of course I don't want to generalize um, but the sense is that you know it was about a year before myself and some of my my folks that I engage with here um, like really got a good sense of what yarns we like um, there was a lot of stash building that was happening and now I feel like a lot of folks are looking to love on their stash, purchase less yarn, and find ways to prioritize what we already have going on. So this is very much a, like take what works for you and leave what doesn't. Um, it's not my intention to be critical of anybody's yarn purchasing behaviors either. So again, I want this to be just like some food for thought, really. I've never used that term on this channel, I feel like, but it really, in my intention, um, is, is food for thought. So let's keep going. <laughs> One last thing I will say before I actually get into the prompts, strategies proper, is that a good number of these ideas are sort of adapted from slow fashion creators that I have been following on social media for many years, even before I got into knitting. Um, so I'm specifically referring to Alyssa Beltempo and Christina Mihas, who are um, both creators based in Canada, which is also kind of cool. Um, but I've looked to them for inspiration for a really long time. And I was surprised I was, as I was thinking about this at how much of the learnings I've taken from their content could be applied in this scenario. So giving credit where credit's due, um, some of these ideas have been adapted a bit from things that they've said over the years. So number one, first and foremost, you do have to spend time with the yarn that you have. And this can take a few different shapes, but I would encourage you to start with an audit and really get a good sense of what yarns you're using, what yarns you're not using, and what the patterns are. And so I'm talking about things like, are there particular colors 
or color families that you're very drawn to initially but don't find yourself wanting to knit? Or are there particular types of yarn dyeing that you're not a huge fan of? Do you love speckles but hate variegated yarn or vice versa? Um, what kinds of weights are you drawn to or not drawn to? Do you have any quantities of yarn that might be awkward to use? You're not sure what to do with a single skein or two skeins of yarn, or you just are shy of a sweater quantity. Um, do you have any recency bias? So are you much more drawn to your newer yarns? And why are your older yarns still hanging out in stash? That is kind of where I'm going with this. And it's okay to resell or gift or donate yarn. That's what I did in January. And honestly, it felt like a necessary step for me to really be able to re-love my stash. Um, but before you do that, it is really important to decide why or figure out why you are choosing to let those yarns go. Another really helpful way to spend time with your yarn is to literally move them around and try to come up with new yarn combinations or envision multiple projects for the yarn. I think that we tend to do a lot of project planning by looking at what we have saved in social media or going through platforms like Ravelry, but I've surprised myself a good number of times when I've just like looked at the yarns I've had in front of me and seen two yarns side by side that I hadn't seen together before and I ended up loving it and rolling with it. So I think I think there is something to be said for like pulling out your yarns and then quite literally shuffling them around. And I do think that there are a lot of projects that can be suited to this like mix and matchiness that aren't necessarily like do a striped sock. Um, one example that comes to mind would be like the Sycamore sweater by Petite Knit and how she's marled a whole bunch of different mohairs and fingering weight yarns to create those sort of like scars that go through the center or that go across the body of the sweater. I think that's a really cool way to mix and match your yarns in an unexpected way or a way that you might not have planned for when you made your initial purchase, especially if you have scraps. My second uh, sort of strategy is to build a color palette and be able to define your yarn or your knitting or your personal style. So I do want to start with that personal style piece. I think that even just using three words, and this is definitely, this is what I got from Melissa Bell Tempo. She says you should define your personal style with three words and everything you bring into your wardrobe should ideally fit all three words, but you're looking for at least two of them. Adjectives or just descriptors that you can rely on as like a step one for your decision making process when you're thinking of what you want to knit and what you might want to knit it with. So for myself, those words might be contemporary, um, which for me evokes like relaxed, boxy kinds of fits um, and clean lines. And so I have contemporary and relaxed, which can sometimes feel at odds with each other. But I think that if you play with proportions again and like drape and fit, you can definitely get there and low contrast. For the most part, I tend to dress somewhat tonally. Um, so for me, a high contrast marl might not be what I want to do with my yarn. I might go for a low contrast marl. I probably won't go for a super heavily variegated yarn. I might opt for something more tonal. Again, because I'm looking for like clean lines, not a lot of visual interest or like intentional clashing going on in colors or anything like that. So I think that that is helpful for deciding like if I'm wearing a garment in this yarn, is it going to work for me? Now when it comes to the color palette, I think that this is really important because you can't break rules if you don't know that they exist. Let me tell you a little story.
here are some of my more recent and some of my most worn garments. Yes, we have this delicious, colorful cardigan in this Noro yarn, but it's like initial read is still quite neutral because it has this gray base. I have knit a silvery and lightly speckled camisole in some linen and cotton and tensile yarns. I have knit a straight up beige sweater. I have knit a gray sweater with just some yellow speckles. So you can kind of get this sense that my preferences for yarn colors when it comes to garments are typically like pretty neutral with maybe just a little something extra that cues you to the fact that like this is handmade, this isn't store-bought, it has just this little bit of extra visual interest. And so my color palette for the most part is pretty neutral and then the colors I tend to go for are on the warmer side of things and I tend to like warm purples, warm reds and oranges, and warm greens. I don't go for blue too often, to be honest. I do like a good like petroleum color, but I think that's because it's drawing on the green. And so I have this good sense of like my key neutrals and a couple of key colors that I like to work with. And I know I'm not gonna go for a cool toned gray or cool toned brown most of the time. I'll opt for warmer options for that. But recently, I really wanted something hot pink. And this is very different from these. But I felt confident making this choice because I knew what rules in my color palette I needed to break to achieve this. And I knew what rules I had to stick with. And so even though this is like a bright, hot pink, knowing that I prefer warmer toned colors by going for something with these orange and red speckles and by going for something a little bit more tonal, I feel like I was still able to get something that makes sense in the context of what I like to wear. So my suggestion for building a color palette is really to give you a sense of guidance when you're making your color choices. I was finding personally, um, and I think I've heard Caroline from Caroline's Knits talk about this before as well, um, maybe also Rachel from Night Sky Knitting, but what I was finding was that the yarns that I was drawn to in the skein form were often colors that I found really inspiring but wouldn't necessarily enjoy wearing. And I think it's taken up until like the midpoint of 2022 for me to really get a solid sense of which colors I will wear um, and which colors, if I am like so absolutely obsessed with them, might be better suited for something that won't be as much like of a garment, might be an accessory or socks or not even a wearable object. Um, but I think that defining my color palette has really helped me be confident in the color choices that I'm making, especially when it comes to garments. And I think another important thing to touch on with the power of the color palette is the fact that if you have yarns that fall within this complementary color palette, when you do inevitably generate scraps, they will work together and that'll make using your scraps even that much easier. And then on the note of scraps, I do think it's important that you figure out like a scrappy project style that works for you. So does that mean that you are doing a lot of much smaller projects that use only one, maybe two colors of very small quantities of yarns? So if you have like 30 or 40 grams of a fingering weight yarn and some mohair, you could do a pair of fingerless mitts or a like small scarf. Is that what you would prefer for your scrappy projects? Or are you going to be more committed to a much longer term, super eclectic, really big project that you can just chuck all of your scraps into?
for me, I had previously thought that the former would be the way I wanted to go, being someone who, again, does have this like low contrast, relatively like minimalistic preference for garments, I thought that that's how I would want to do my scrappy projects as well. But I found that having all those smaller projects felt kind of overwhelming to me. And I decided instead that all of my fingering weight and DK weight scraps were going to go into my, you see this like every video now, uh, but my super, super, super eclectic, like absolutely incredible excavation blanket. Like this, I mean, you can see this is all the progress I've made in one month with other projects on the go as well, because I just love seeing these colors come to life. It is the place where I get to play and it's not of so much consequence if, you know, like here, if it's like, whoa, high contrast. So figure out which scrappy route you'll better be able to commit to. I would also encourage you to just like start using your scraps. A big barrier for me for a really long time was feeling like I needed to keep collecting scraps until I had like a sweater's quantity worth of scraps and only then could I do anything with them. But with this blanket, I can just knit what I have and as I generate more scraps, they go into the basket and it's ready to go. Um, so do figure out your scrappy project style. My next prompt is related to yarn subscriptions. So this could be like those monthly or those quarterly boxes, the mystery boxes, advents, those kinds of things. Um, and so really the question is, do you have a plan for these? I know folks can go sort of two routes. They commit to a project and work on the project as the yarn comes to them or they wait to open all of the yarn and then once they see the yarn kind of decide what it's going to become. Um, and so having a plan for at least either one of those ways that you will go can be important, but also what are you going to do with the yarn that you don't love and don't want to use? If you're getting mystery skeins, there is a good chance that there will be at least one that is not your favorite and will you want to use that? Um, and so what alternatives do you have just in case that doesn't work out? And I also do want to say that there are ways to get new yarns that don't require purchasing yarns. So I saw that during the Advent season, a lot of folks did Advent yarn swaps where they would exchange 10 to 20 grams of leftover yarns that they had. And I thought that was a brilliant idea and I hope to be able to participate in something like that this year. But I've also seen local knit groups have meetups where they get together at a coffee shop or a restaurant to knit and chat, but they also bring yarns that they want to swap and they do that at that point. So that could be an interesting way to get a little, you know, stash refresh while also you know, being able to let go of some yarns that you maybe aren't planning to use anymore. My next strategy is to create a separate yarn wish list. I see more often folks talking about project plans and then they associate yarns with them or they don't have yarns for it yet. Um, and folks do like, I, I did flash my stash um, just like showing the yarns I have and what I might do with them. But more often than not, I think our project planning is more project oriented than yarn oriented for some folks, obviously not all folks. Um, but I have, I don't know if I've ever seen or I've seen much more rarely folks talking about like a consolidated yarn wish list or yarns I want to work with, or yarns that I'm interested in using, things like that. Um, and so I think creating a yarn wish list specifically, a yarn wish list that is not necessarily attached to projects or anything like that can be helpful because knitting is slow. And so if you do tend to buy yarn without a project plan, will you want to use that yarn 
five, six months, 12 months later, are your tastes going to change? Are you not going to want to maybe knit the project you had in mind with that yarn anymore? If you can hold off a little bit longer until you are sure that this is something you want, you might have a higher probability of actually ending up using that yarn when it comes time to it. But I do appreciate how having a yarn wish list can be a little bit challenging because a lot of indie dyed yarn, for example, is released in you know limited drops, pre-orders, mystery boxes, uh, and it's a good business strategy for these people who have absolutely incredible products but it does create this sense of urgency or scarcity mindset that can kind of drive us to purchase uh, maybe a little bit more or a little less mindfully than we ought to. So now I'm going to move into the part of this video where I don't really have like strategies or prompts anymore. All of these things are like so intertwined and like mutually reinforcing that I don't even know like how clearly discreet these prompts or strategies are. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about how we engage with knitting social media and how influencing and the recent content trend of de-influencing kind of factor into this conversation. I really think that it's not the content creator's responsibility to create content that explicitly influences or de-influences. I do think it's our responsibility as social media consumers to develop the self-awareness and the habits of mind to recognize when we are being influenced and how that is impacting our decision making. And now this is where my suggestion kind of gets muddied with what I was talking about earlier about slow fashion. You'll see a lot of folks when they're talking about like no buy or just buying less in general, they'll say just unsubscribe, unfollow the accounts and the email lists that are driving you to spend and to consume. And if you do genuinely have what you believe is an unhealthy relationship with a particular account or email list, then it is completely and totally okay to unfollow and to unsubscribe. However, I think that because the knitting community is supported by and the knitting community supports so many small businesses, it's important to remember that supporting these small businesses and buying from them are not mutually exclusive. So if it is important to you to support small, you can do so without over consuming yarn. You can engage with them on social media and share their content. It's not lost on me that that sort of reinforces the marketing strategy of influencing and de-influencing, which is why this is like such a hard and nuanced conversation to have. But I think then what's really important is, again, for us to recognize what is influencing our decision making process. And so I think that like on the one hand, while like influencing and driving overconsumption is not a great thing, I'm not also 100% behind de-influencing as a trend of content on social media. Because again, I feel like at the end of the day, influencing and de-influencing are kind of the same thing. They just have different outcomes. And to be very reductive about it, it is somebody coming on camera or posting on like a static image saying you should get this or you should not get this, or maybe not even being that explicit, but really talking up or really talking down a product. Both of them are the same thing, just different outcomes. They're still influencing. It's still ultimately, I take information from you and that helps me make my decision. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Again, I just think it's so important that we recognize when that information we are taking in is making more of the decision for us than our own values, intentions, sense of personal style, etc. I think one way to help mitigate that is again to create a color palette, maybe even a mood board that is more reflective of 
your personal style as a whole, as opposed to just like, here's just the colors. Um, here's really what I want for my style going forward. I've been really trying to do mood boards this year instead of explicit project planning, because I think that that's doing a better job of capturing what I do and do not want to make. Um, and I think that as a result has allowed me to slow down with my knitting and not feel like I need to be knitting garments all of the time because I have a sense of where the gaps in my wardrobe are that I want to fill and what I can sort of leave for when I'm actually feeling inspired for it. So that's all I wanted to say today on the topic of yarn buying and intentionality. I know a lot of this sort of leads into other aspects of knitting and making like project intentionality um, and engaging with social media intentionally and all of these things. So I apologize if it felt kind of muddied in that sense, but I do think that sometimes the most important things to share are the muddiest thoughts because they are the things that are truly on my heart and on my mind. And, you know, reflections that I personally find helpful for my own practice. So I hope you find it helpful for your practice. Again, from this video, take what worked and leave what didn't. Um, I hope there was some value in it for you, but um, I would love to know if there's anything else that you do that you think is unique to your process of project planning or yarn buying. I am very much a project-oriented knitter, so a lot of my reflections and my thoughts on this topic do come from that place. I can recognize and appreciate that many folks do get more inspiration from having a sort of yarn-first process, in which case a lot of what I said just might not apply. Um, but if your sort of goals for this year um, or for your future, your immediately future knitting are to like prioritize stash and be more intentional in that way, I'm not saying you have to do this, um, but if that is something that is already an area of interest for you, uh, that's what this video is for. So until I get to see y'all again, I am wishing you health and happy knitting. Bye, everyone.